Hello and welcome to another episode of Focus on Tomorrow. I'm your host, DJ, and I would like to remind everybody that Focus on Tomorrow is a non educational non for profit locate, located in Chicago, Illinois. You can find us on the web at www.focus-on-tomorrow.org or you can email us at info at focus-on-tomorrow.org. Today we have, our get, we have a guest with us, Chris Millett. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Yeah. Today's topic will be on the Chicago Violence Reduction Strategy, which is an organization. Actually, can you explain to our viewers who don't know what it is, what, she, what the Chicago Violence Reduction sure, Strategy is? Sure, sure. Thanks for having me on Focus on Tomorrow. Um, Chris Mill, I'm the Executive Director of the Chicago Violence Reduction Strategy. We are an organization that seeks to reduce gang shootings and homicides, really group, we call it group shootings and homicides. It could be gang, clique, crew, whatever the case may be but it's the dynamic of group violence is what we aim to reduce. We've been here in Chicago operating for about six years now, since August of 2010, uh, and we do it really with uh, three pillars of, of partnership. We're, first I'll make sure everyone understands, we're a strategy. We are uh, specifically not known as a uh, initiative or a program. Uh, it's a strategy. We take some of the best things that people have been doing in the community, in law enforcement, and uh, as well as, as with social services and outreach, working with gang members, working with ex-offenders, and we try to integrate it in the play. Uh, so we work with law enforcement agencies, we work with community groups, uh, what we call the community moral voice, which are churches, schools, hospitals, uh, community-based organizations, and just individuals in the community. And then we also work with uh, social service outreach uh, community agencies as well that uh, specify and, and their subject matter experts in working with gang members and also working with uh, those on probation and parole because most of our uh, the individuals that we work with uh, have are on probation or parole mainly parole All right uh, how was the violence reduction strategy created well we started off in uh, 2010 uh, at the time I was working in Mayor Daly's office, I was on his cabinet and I was the uh, Director of Community Safety Initiative. So I was a liaison for youth violence, juvenile justice, gangs, guns, and ex-offender reentry. And we were approached by uh, David Kennedy at John Jay College of Criminal Justice uh, with a new, uh, well it wasn't new, it's, it's a model that was originated in Boston, Massachusetts in the mid-1990s, referred to in public safety circles as the Boston Miracle and it brings everyone together to focus on reducing violence, uh, in particular group violence. So everybody has a role. Uh, the way it got to Chicago was David Kennedy. I met David Kennedy. David Kennedy came in to talk with Mayor Daley. We were introduced, uh, and then we began a pilot program here in two districts. Uh, now, six years later, I work full-time for the Chicago Violence Reduction Strategy and with John Jay College of Criminal Justice with the National Network of Safe Communities, and we are in all 22 districts in the city. All right, uh, I will. We now have a caller. I would like to th say, ask the caller to say, ask their question. Hi, good evening, gentlemen. Years ago, I may have been one of the number one persons around here that been saying that bring in the National Guard. We don't need the National Guard. There's other strategies that we can use. No matter what type of strategy people bring up, somebody gonna be against it. Now, I'm not talking about stop. And Fritz. I'm gonna say that again. I'm not talking about stop and Fritz. I'm talking about stop and question. When you stop somebody and you find that person is on probation, on parole, guess what? As a condition of being out of prison or not being in prison, guess what? You can be searched. Now, if you know you you meet one of those type of criteria, you gotta think about not having that gun out there on the street. And we look at the majority of the crimes that are being committed out there on the street, guess what? It's either somebody's on probation or, or on p patrol. And they're talking about, uh, I mean, like I said, probation or parole. And that's a lot of the, uh, 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 the, the crime that's happening out here in the street. And no matter what you say, people still going to be an up in arm about that. Like I said, it's a difference between stop and question compared to stop and frisk. And I'm not talking about in certain areas we have to have a drag, I mean, a, uh, a drag in that. And then it wouldn't hurt if we have a, a curfew, you know. And that may break, if it helps save some lives or, or some type of strategy, we need to be thinking about what can we do to save some lives now. Right. I, I, I will tell you this. I will say that uh, 
this isn't the work that we do isn't stop and frisk or or stop and question. Um, we're civilians. We're not law enforcement. We partner with law enforcement. Uh, we will go door to door. What we call custom notifications. Everything we do is based upon a central message, and the message is the violence is not acceptable. The violence won't be tolerated, and it's a message that's delivered with a unified front. It's with law enforcement, community, and outreach and support. Uh, so we do it in a group setting, with which we call a call-in, where we bring in group members, representatives from each of the different factions in the community, and address them with community members, as well as law enforcement members and agencies. Uh, and then there's always an offer for help. Everything we do is an integrated approach with an offer for help at the end. And one of the things that we do is we try to eliminate any excuses. So if someone says, well, I'm an ex-offender and I can't find employment or I can't do it, we have the experts that are in the room who are there knocking on your door and sitting in the room at the end of the meeting uh, for you to connect with immediately. There's no wait list. Uh, I love our partners. Our partners throughout the community uh, have changed some of their policies where the guys that sign up for help and ask for help go to the top of the list. Uh, many of the guys, almost all of the guys that we're working with, uh, are up to 500 times more likely to be victims of violence because of the social networks that they're in. Uh, but the things that we're doing, uh, we partner with law enforcement. We are not law enforcement. Um, we do value the partnership, and we think that it can't be done. Uh, I do think it can be done. I think you said it as well, uh, without the National Guard. I don't think we want to bring the National Guard in. I don't think for a number of reasons that that's a, a, a prudent idea. Um, but I do think also that... Uh, uh, it has to be a partnership with law enforcement. I think law enforcement is part of the beloved community and it's part of the social fabric of each and every one of our communities. So are our gang members, those that are in groups, cliques, blocks, whatever. They're part of our social fabric. And I think as long as we continue to divorce one or the other and try to do it separately, we'll end up with what we've always had. You know, so that's a large part of our strategy is how do we bring people together around the table? How do we integrate our approach? Obviously, we respect boundaries uh, that people need to operate and to work within. Um, but at the end of the day, our number one goal is that people live. Number one, that you live. Number two, we want you out of prison. But in order to live, you may need to take a time out. That's not the goal, though. The goal is that how do we reduce serious levels of violence in our city without continuing to incarcerate and lock up large numbers of black and brown men? How do you do that? Who's even trying to do that? We found partners with the National Network of Safe Communities. But that's why, again, I appreciate your call, sir. Um, that's why it's a strategy. It's not a program. It's not an initiative. A lot of the best things that are going on uh, in the law enforcement community, there's some great things and some innovative things that have been going on for years uh, in the social service community. Same thing. And then we can never neglect, and sometimes we forget our most valuable and some of our most valuable resources uh, in this war against violence and to stop violence and to stop uh, what's going on in our communities uh, and the devastating effect, which are the community residents themselves. That's what we call the community moral voice. Because there is, we argue that there is a moral voice in every community. It may be silenced, it may have been uh, gone quiet uh, for good reason, for bad reason, whatever the case may be. But that voice, we believe, still resonates and is still there. And what we find is that when you talk with and you spend time and you engage uh, with dignity and you engage uh, individuals who are group members, you find that the vast majority of people are logical, rational thinking human beings. And you just present options. All we could do is educate another individual and present them with options, in particular options they think they may not have had before. Um, and then it's up to them. It's their decision. What would be some of the options that you would present to gang members? Well, one of the things we look at is we really the question is, what do you need? You know, uh, understand the risk that you're at, the legal risk that you're at. A lot of individuals who are out there, like the gentleman said, you do find a lot of people on parole uh, who are shooting people. You know, how are they continuously recycling back on the street? Uh, that's a bigger issue. You know, there's a lot of systems in play here, the judicial system, the uh, legal system, law enforcement system, the social service system, the educational system, we can't really figure, how do, you, how do you tackle that? Where do you begin? We begin with number one, which is number one to us is that you live. At our top priority is that you live. And if you look at those that are, uh, the vast majority of those being shot in Chicago, 
the research shows Andy Papacristos at Yale University did a study looking at 10 years of violence in, in, in Chicago and five years in Garfield Park. And what it showed is that our violence, and I think it resonates with anyone who lives in the community, uh, the communities where we live, work and where we live. And, and that is that the violence in Chicago is tragic. It's always tragic. But our violence is not that random. Even when you have innocent people, and I mean, you don't want anyone to get shot. But when you have the incidents of the, of the young children, when you have the incidents of the grandmothers, you have the incident of the, the, the retired men, uh, the, the old man that was sitting in the grandfather, sitting in his house, uh, watching TV. When you have those incidents, there's a clear target that individuals are shooting at. I think that's a larger conversation that we need to have as a community, is what is really going on here. We need to be willing to talk about it. We need to be willing to address it. Maybe in a safe space, I don't know. But we need to address everything across the board. I was asked the other day, what do you attribute the rise in violence to? You know, why is there so much, you know, who's responsible? Is a, a news reporter from the New York Times asked me, who would you say is responsible for the increase in shootings in the city of Chicago? And my response was, number one, there's a lot of societal things, but who's directly responsible? The people pulling the triggers. That's who's directly responsible for the increase in shootings in Chicago. How do we stop it? That's a larger question. And I think we stop it together. That's a large part of our strategy. It's people working together. It's agencies working together. We need to come together if we're going to address this issue. The police cannot do it on their own. Parole and probation and judicial system cannot do it on their own. The community cannot do it on their own. But together, I think that's how we could get something done and we could try to produce some sustainable results. All right. Do you find that uh, recidivism through unemployment is a major cause for gang members going and shooting people if you know, they're fr out of jail? Yeah, you know, I, I think recidivism, I think, I think uh, poverty, uh, lack of education, lack of resources, uh, lack of employment, those are all critical pieces that need to be addressed. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, if you look at how many poor people are there in Chicago, how many poor black and brown people are there in Chicago? And are they arming themselves because they're poor? And are they shooting people? And if you really look at, dissect the shootings. You know, you talk about 64 shootings during Memorial Day weekend. Start to dissect the shootings. Where did those shootings occur? Who was involved in those shootings? What are the backgrounds of the individuals? What time was it? You know, I, I think what you find is you find that the vast majority, you have people who can be armed quite easily. You see people who are driving on suspended licenses, got pulled over, got arrested. Then they're out on the street again, driving again involved in a shooting the next night. All right. Uh, I see we have a caller. Caller, go ahead. You, you brought up about those studies. We have a lot of studies that being um, being done by University of Chicago and maybe by UIC as well, where it costs them like a million and a half to two or three million dollars, where the federal government, state, and even the city doing it, and we got all this money being spent to that, why come some of that money can't be used towards the youth, uh, like in the city of Chicago, where they can have a part-time job after school, but yet we could spend 2 or $3 million on the city, state, and federal level, and they just take a little bit of that money. Who knows what, you know, how much crime it will bring down, but yet they can spend millions for that. You know, I, I'm, I'm not I don't disagree with you at all. Not with that. I mean, I, I think that the studies, the way the system is now, I mean, you need the studies and you need the research to have the evidence-based practices to convince legislators and other people that this is where you want to invest the dollars. This is what works. This is what we believe is going to be successful, rather than just give the money to the people that you just always gave the money to. You know, what actually is going to work here? You know, I would argue and we argue that really at the end of the day, it's relationships as well. I could give a, a young person a job. I could give a young adult a job. And that's a critical component that we need. But beyond the job, how do they view their place in society? How do they view their place in our city? If they just see their place, this is just a transitional job, a temporary job. This is a bandit. It's a temporary fix. I'll get my money here. There's a lot of group members, gang members, whatever you want to call them, who are employed full-time, who go to school full-time, yet they still shoot people. They're still engaged in that life. And I think part of it is, what is the nature of the individuals? Dr. Carl Bell said something to me 
uh, I guess he's written it, so he's said it to a lot of people, but I had a chance to have a conversation with him probably about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and he said something that resonated with me and stuck with me to this day, which was this, and it gets to your point on jobs uh, and opportunities for young people and the connections really is what's important. And what he said was that risk factors are not predictive factors if you have strong enough protective factors. So I think really one of the things we need to really dig into is looking at, and, and, you know, what are the protective factors we have in play and in place for our young people and for our young adults? Because the reality is, is this thing that we're dealing with is not being driven by a juvenile population. You know, the super predators, it's, come on, it's not really what people said it was going to be. It's not what it is. What's happening now? You know, you have a lot of, how is social media involved? How can Google get involved? How can social media get involved? So when people decide that they're going to cyber gangbang and insult people and, and do things that are going to cause a shooting off of the Internet, you know, how can everybody kind of step in and pitch in? And I understand there's a lot of freedoms that we don't want to touch, but I do think we're smart enough as a society and smart enough as, as, a, as a city to figure this thing out. I just think it, it really comes down to accountability. Everybody is responsible at some level for what we're experiencing right now. And everybody could play a part in remediating what we're dealing with. All right. I see we have a caller. Caller, go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a question. Do you have any strategies for young people to use when being approached by police officers? We do. I mean, one of the things that we've done is we've we've actually worked with the Chicago Police Department. The Chicago Police Department now has, uh, and not now, they've had it for a couple of years now, uh, procedural justice and uh, police legitimacy is taught in the academy. And those officers who are on the street, they had come back in and, and it was taught to them as well. Uh, they're also working on, in, in the academy, uh, they're beginning to teach, uh, partnering with street inter intervention agencies, street outreach workers, uh, in particular, uh, I think on the west side right now. Um, but I think, you know, the strategy in talking and in, in engaging law enforcement, it's really the strategy that I think young people and anybody should engage in engaging or uh, utilize in engaging anyone who's in a position of authority. And that is being respectful, even if they're not in a position of authority. You know, number one, be respectful. Number two, always keep your head. And number three, understand you're dealing with people. You're not dealing with robots. You know, so who knows the day the person has had. And we, pray, we prayerfully, we, you know, I, I, you believe the best in people. And I think that's how, that's, that's my advice. I mean, that's the advice I give to my, my, my sons. I have four boys. You know, I'm raising four African-American boys in the city of Chicago. You know, it's a little bit different environment for them than it is for some other people, you know. So they need to understand very clearly, you know, just the neighborhood, where you are, understand your surroundings, uh, and then understand really when you engage people, you know, engage with respect. Usually it's give respect, and sometimes if someone doesn't earn the respect, you know, I give it anyway because that's the way I was raised. All right. I see we have a caller. Caller, go ahead. Oh, hello. Um, I was looking, I'm listening to you guys, and thanks for um, taking my call. I just want to say there is grant money out there. I know Health and Human Services got like almost $700 million that they're going to give to the undocumented. But the grants for us, we have to apply for. They had a W.D. Du Bois grant for $64 million on grant.gov, and that was going to be where you would work with the, um, the police community, work with social workers and all that, and work with the community to get, um, like you say, to um, help develop them to be um, conflict resolution. So if you go to grant.gov on a regular basis, you'll see grants available. And um, I think, um, it, of course, you have to make sure your, you know, your writing skills are up, but they have um, help sections to where you could just write the grant. So there is money out there. It's just our political leaders haven't really got block grants or grants that focus on the South Side. And that's what I want to tell you. Thank you. And you know what? I think you could have your own show on Can TV just talking about grants and what's available. Maybe. Because because I, I do think part of it is uh, just a lack of information that is that is in certain communities. And we know the communities, poor communities, communities of color. You know, but understanding exactly what's going on, how it's going on, how it affects you, um, how it you know, and that information uh, and what's available. One of the key things that we do when we engage group members, you know, uh, is that we tell them, you know, look, 
These are options. You know, what do you need? For far too often, we have a patriarchal approach where we just assume, you know, your parenting is horrible, your parents are terrible, your family is terrible, you're poor, you got a horrible education, and you need a job. And we look at those. But if you ever ask people, what do you need, instead of making assumptions, and then see, you know what, you might be halfway on your way there down the road. You're, you enrolled yourself in community college. You got your GED. Now you're taking classes, but you're still kind of out here. And one of the things that we find is we find that a lot of individuals, they want to do better, but they don't know how. And they don't have anyone who's showing them or talking to them about how. They don't have anyone coaching them up or even encouraging them to the point where they really feel, you know what? And then they, they hear the same promises over and over again, and then apathy begins to set in. So one of the things where we work with our community partners, we're forever grateful to them because our community partners really dig in and they make sure that they are utilizing a network. They're more mature, they're mature enough not to think that they can solve everything on their own. So they refer people out within their network and just see how can we better help people move ahead, and in particular this cohort. Because in this particular cohort, you have individuals who are three to 500 times more likely to be shot or to shoot somebody down the road. So how important is it to really kind of dig in with this group and help to start, you know, at least attempt and, and work on figuring out some solutions. All right. Uh, earlier you mentioned that you go door to de- door and have call-in groups and then that you ask people what they want, you know, give them options for getting through what, getting through their pain or uh, helping them get out of this gang-style life. All right. What are the options that you give them, you know? Well, it, it's not what they want. It's it's kind of what do you need is our is a question really because you ask someone what do you want they'll say I want a job I want this and then we say okay you want a job can do you have a degree you know are you qual what are you qualified for can you pass a drug test is the number one question you know we like to smoke marijuana and do certain things like it's drinking milk out of the refrigerator and we know where things are heading politically in this country but right now the last time I checked in Cook County marijuana is still illegal uh, for the most part. So you can say what you want or do what you want, but you were not not hired because of, you know, the guy didn't like you. You weren't hired because you couldn't pass a drug test or you lost your job because you failed a drug test or you don't have a degree or you don't have a GED or a diploma or you have an uh, an arrest record or a profile, whatever the case may be, uh, a background, a criminal background. So we look at those things and we acknowledge those things and we look at those barriers and how do we overcome those barriers. So it may be you're on parole, you need to meet parole mandates. It may be you need housing. Your housing situation needs to change. It may be substance abuse. You know, we work with Safer Foundation. They got a great program that works with, that helps individuals uh, step down off of marijuana so that they can be empl- you know can pass a drug test. Um, maybe you need a jo- job training skills. Maybe you need job placement. You know, whatever the case may be, we look at the on a case by case basis with individuals uh, what it is that they need, and then we look at and sometimes there's things we call the the big the small. The, the, the big small stuff, an ID, you know, a bus pass, those types of things, so they can move around to get to different meetings and different appointments. All right. Uh, if somebody wanted to volunteer and help out at the Chicago Violence Reduction Strategy, how would they do that? They could call uh, the Chicago Violence uh, Reduction Strategy directly, um, and, and then we could see what we could do as, as far as where they could fit in. Uh, most of our volunteers right now speak at our call-ins and addressing gang members and group members uh, and participate with our uh, custom notifications where we talk to individuals. Uh, and it's usually agencies. It's done through agencies. Uh, an individual coming in, uh, we want to be respectful of the background of individuals that we're going to meet with uh, and not have a, a, like a gangbanger zoo type of deal where everybody kind of crowds around and sees the gang members and, yeah. ooh, who's this guy? They, re- they deserve you know, a certain level of uh, uh, privacy, especially if they're moving. And it's understanding that people are in transition all the time. If you've been involved in a lifestyle on the street for seven, eight, nine, three, four, two years, it's not going to be an overnight process where you just get out or where you just stop. And also what level people are involved in. Uh, and then what, what, what type of support network they have? What are those protective factors like Dr. Bell talked about? All right. Uh, do you have anything to add? Any last comments? No, I, what, what I will say is, is, is I encourage everyone in the city of Chicago. Uh, I was told by Coach Lou Holtz at Notre Dame at one point, 
to uh, you're never as bad as they say you are when you're losing, and you're never as bad as or as good as they say you are when you're winning. So I encourage everybody to keep their heads down. Let's just keep working together because only together are we going to resolve the situations in front of us. I don't think any superhero is going to come in and save us, save the day for us. We have to work together and we have to realize the value added by each and every member of our community, whatever agency or whatever background they come from in helping to resolve the violence issues that are plaguing our communities. And thank you for the time. Hey, thank you for coming on. Uh, I would like to remind everybody that this is Focus on Tomorrow, and we're an educational non nonprofit. Uh, you can find us on the web at www.focus on tomorrow.org, or you can email us at info at focus on tomorrow.org. I would like to thank you again, Mr. Millette, for coming on, and uh, I would like to say I'm DJ, and it was a pleasure hosting today. <laughs>